So Diane, I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I think you have an experience in so many of the different areas that we've been covering on the channel recently. Um, we've done a lot around difficult conversations, polarization, and you have a unique background in that. I think you've been a mediator for several decades. You're also a, a Zen priest with a background in meditation, and you've also got the integral framework that we found really useful to make sense of a lot of these cultural issues. Thanks for having me, and also thanks for your website. I think you guys are doing a fabulous job of bringing all these different streams of understanding together so that we can have a more comprehensive view of how to be most helpful. So thank you. Yeah, and I think you're bringing a really valuable perspective, so I'm looking forward to, to putting that out as well. Yeah. So just sort of framing this at the beginning, you've obviously been in the area of mediation for several decades. Do you think that we are in a more polarized, a more difficult time than before? And how would you frame that? How, how, how difficult do you think it is? I, I would say yes. Certainly in my lifetime, I, I feel like the polarization politically and in the public discourse is more extreme and that there is uh, a kind of general sense of threat that we've talked about on both sides of this polarization. I think some of the, it's due to lots of different factors, complexity, stresses, some of the existential threats that we talk about, um, the speed of technology, the lack of groundedness and a relationship to nature as a, as a way of calibrating the nervous system. Um, and just, just generally speaking, the sort of human population and pres pressures on the globe. So there are all kinds of reasons for why it's the case, but I think the last time we experienced this in the States was during the Vietnam War, where there was intense polarization. But the one thing that was really quite different then, in my view, is that the media still held this sort of third-person empiric perspective. So at the end of the day, there were three channels. They were reporting on facts and um, and that, so basically the kind of second person struggle was mediated to some degree by, by media. Whereas now, as we know, media is highly um, opinionated and filtered. And we don't have that sort of empiric voice, which in a certain way, you know, our justice system relies on that. Um, you know, science relies on that. And, and in the public discourse, we don't have a mediating third party. Yeah, and I think it's even hard to imagine what or who that might be nowadays. And what do you think are the most relevant tips or practices from conflict resolution that, that we need to develop? Well, you've given a lot of attention on your channel on, uh, to, and on your website to this question of, of the neurobiology. And I would agree with many of the people that you've interviewed that within a conflict situation, neurobiology drives a lot of what happens. So we really do need to start there in terms of um, the, the relaxed resting state or the social state, in terms of fight or flight, and then um, at this question of shutting down. Um, so I think that working with the body is sort of the first thing, and that can be individually or that can be working in small groups, but I think it can also be worked with a little bit at scale because it's such it's so contagious when fight or flight or being triggered or aroused is happening it usually spreads relatively easily so one of the technologies would, would be how to calm an entire room or how to calm how to calm a large group of people at once that would be one thing that we would really care about in my work, um, I really am pointing people to the body a lot to really experience states of relaxation when the room becomes coherent, when energy is flowing easily, and when the nervous systems are aroused, when there's high differentiation, when the experience of threat or of defensiveness arises, and how to actually not to one of the differences I may have with some people is not to necessarily always seek to calm that differentiation and arousal, but rather to utilize it to bring more, more creativity and sometimes more intensity into the room so that it actually can really serve to heighten people's awareness, to bring people fully into a state together, and then what is the moment where you need to now shift into some sort of fluidity. So I think the neurobiology is really, really critical. Um, you know, the very typical skills that come from good communication or from circling, skills like listening, 
reflecting, expressing yourself, um, connecting to your own life force and energy around what's passionate when you express yourself, learning how to express opinions that are not necessarily going to be shared, how do you do it in a way that's respectful of others, how do you also hold multiple perspectives. Now right here it gets a little bit dicey because some of these communication skills correlate to what we, we talk about when we talk about human development. It is not a given that everyone in the room can hold two perspectives in their body-mind at the same time without an overabundance of chaos and tension and will naturally collapse into one. So one of the ways that I became engaged with Ken Wilber and Integral Institute is in my work as a mediator, particularly around difficult conversations like race and gender and social justice and those kinds of things, is I started to observe real differences in people's capacities. Some people couldn't take their own perspective. They'd either been abused or marginalized. Some people could take one perspective, their own, but not the other. Some people could take their own and even start to be able to hear the perspective of others, but couldn't take a perspective of a court or a judge. And that was literally that observation I started to use a stage model in my own work. I started to work with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grief to talk about race, people in denial, people angry, bargaining. And then shortly after that, I was introduced to Ken. So we have to talk development whenever we talk about these skill sets. So we have the body, we have the simple communication skills. I think there's a lot about negotiation that really is helpful, and I think the book that Roger Fisher and William Murray wrote back in the 80s, Getting to Yes, is a really simple, great model for negotiation, and that's really important. And then, then questions around authority and leadership is another one we have to look at. You and I were speaking earlier about it's difficult to find people that can represent a new, neutral perspective. Um, within pluralist culture, we tend to flatten hierarchies and we want leadership to emerge. Um, from a grassroots perspective. So that's just a basket full of things that I think are important. Differences in cultural sets, differences in rituals, differences in how we come into ceremony together. Those are all things that, from a big picture, are at play when we talk about conflict resolution. Yeah, there was a, there was a lot there that I'm really interested to, to dig into. Uh, the physiology piece, um, let's start with, because we were just talking a little bit before we started recording, and one of the things that I think is incredibly valuable from the work that we put out, the interviews that we did with um, Stephen Porges and reflecting on his polyvagal theory and the somatic experiencing work, is this idea about either being an exploratory or defensive frame of mind. And you, you sort of disagreed with that. And I, I, I think it's really interesting that you, you raise the question of, well, sometimes we need to have a little bit more disagreement or elevate the, the energy in the room. And I think that I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Yes, I would agree. And now, and I, I, this is how I think a little bit. And keep in mind, I'm, I'm a mediator in the trenches. I work with people. I'm in great admiration of theorists and map, map makers. I rely on them, but in really, really crude strokes. So I've learned a tremendous amount from, from Ken Wilber, as you know, and others. But I'm, I just do it on the spot. And what I've observed, there's an idea that you know, that the universe kind of creates itself through this incredible feedback loop of sameness and difference, right? That, that um, at any one moment, you know, we take something like a great sports play, there's a tremendous amount of coherence and there's also differentiation, right? Because if there isn't differentiation, someone doesn't receive the pass and, and go for the basket. So it's both, you know, it's sameness and difference all the time. And these, these, are, these correlate to the body. So this sense of relaxation, of coherence, of sameness, and the feeling of psychological safety is really important. But the arousal in the nervous system is also similarly important in terms of our growth. So we differentiate in order to grow and expand. So one of the things that I've been exploring and working with is the idea that the brain also evolves that way, that it evolves through the kind of highly coherent systems and then new, new pathways emerge and then those pathways become integrated. So my proposition is that we're capable of being triggered and either through extending awareness as coming from meditation practice, feeling triggered and being super aware and expanding ourselves to include the whole experience of the space or giving a cognitive cue like, 
I know I'm triggered right now, but actually I'm going to continue to listen to what someone's saying to me, and I'm going to look for the moment when relaxation sets back in again. And I kind of believe that doing that is creating some new pathways in the brain. I could be wrong, you know, because I really, I'm not an expert in that. But the sense that you can actually get to where you can do both, because that's what we can start to do, is we do these, we move to more complexity. So it's one thing to be super relaxed in the nervous system and not be able to receive information. It's another thing to be triggered and actually capable of hearing information that then affects the nervous system. So that's how I think about it. Whether it's true or not, I really don't know. It is in my experience. I'd also like to, to talk to you about collective intelligence, which is something that we've been discussing quite a bit on the channel recently and had a, a lot of really interesting contributions from people like Jamie Wheel, Daniel Schmachtenberger, Jordan Greenhall, Benita Roy, and quite a few others. And yeah, I know that you've got a few perspectives to, to offer because I think you've also seen some of these, these films. So I might um, be interested to, to, to just ask you to kind of freestyle a little bit on what you think are the important distinctions and the important differences between, for example, coherence and collective intelligence um, the nature of difference and the nature of coherence and how it's important to balance those. Um, and how, how would you start, how would you frame what collective intelligence means to you before we sort of go into those distinctions? I see collective intelligence as uh, basically the capacity of a group, regardless of size, to function optimally and holistically and compassionately for the well-being of the whole. That's how I would define collective intelligence. And again, it can, be, it can be within a family system, it can be within some sort of creative enterprise, or it can be a nation state. You know, what, what is it? How is the group functioning as a collective? And is it, is it for the benefit of the entire group? And Benita Roy drew out a really interesting distinction when I spoke to her that there's a difference between collective intelligence and what she calls collective insight practice, which is more about getting a group of uh, people together and then entering a space where what comes out is more than was present in any one of those people before they, they went in. So it's, it's kind of a, a, almost like a group mind process, which is a slightly different thing, and I think it's a really valuable distinction. Have you had experiences with those kind of processes? Well, you do. I mean, yes. I mean, in the sense that I would say that my uh, probably my earliest training with collective intelligence was as a, as a kid being an athlete and that I was a basketball player. And so a lot of what we were being trained in was collective intelligence, how we, we gave and received to each other in order for us to to perform. I'm less interested in content lots of times, and I'm more interested in watching how energy is moving and how life force is moving. When is the group becoming flat and uninteresting? When is one side becoming victimized and the other side becoming somewhat sadistic? When is there uh, some burst of tremendous creativity and how do people organize and integrate that? So really watching the way in which life force moves and changes beca becomes super important. But I think collective intelligence, sometimes people have the idea that we just perform as a group. And what I'm trying to say that I think individual autonomy is essential to collective intelligence. I think they, they can't be separated. And, and also I think, you know, this is in the context of transformational workshops, but I, I also like to look at transformational workshops to see what lessons can be taken from them that can be applied in culture generally speaking, like the way crisis gives way to new openings, you know, or how um, I always like to say that in my seminars, there's, you know, and they could be, you know, a very small seminar, say under 20 people or 20 people all the way up to seminars with, you know, 600 people, is that there's always just the right amount of trouble. You know, there's always just the right amount of trouble. There's never too much. You never have in a, let's say in a workshop of 50 people, you never have 10 problematic people. You always have two, you know, or you always have three. And I think in some ways, I don't know if that's just what happens in groups, but for some reason, everybody, there's always just enough drama and not too much. So I'm, I'm just interested in how those insights can be applied outside of transformational containers. I don't know that they can.
Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to come back to that because there are a few things that I've learned through the workshops that I've led and the workshops that I've been in, especially from um, a teacher that I'm good friends with who's been doing this for about 40 years. There's a few things that he says that, that have kind of entered my um, way of thinking about the world. For example, one which I think is really powerful is that everything registers in the field. Yes, mm -hmm. I agree. Absolutely true. And just says you, if, if you register, if you're feeling something, then if you don't address it, it's going to play out in some way at, at, at some time, which is a yes. really crucial realization, I think. Yes. And, and to some degree, when we start, we start working with groups in this way, um, where everything plays out in the field and we trust the unfolding and we attend to crises and we give the right amount of support but not too much and we allow um, the natural impulse toward the natural evolutionary impulse to express itself, um, it is ama amazing how much people transform. I do really wonder how those principles could be applied on a different scale, if possible. You know, I really wonder about that. It's a deep, a deep inquiry of mine. And you, you mentioned before, I think maybe in our previous conversation, a little bit about coherence and difference and how you maybe have a slightly different view to the one that was expressed by Daniel Schmachtenberger and Jamie Wheel around this. Would you like to, to, to expand on that? Yes. Um... So Jamie has done a tremendous amount of work on flow. And, you know, I think his, his three characteristics of flow that, and maybe that it comes from the, the other person whose name I can never pronounce, but effortlessness, selflessness, and, and timelessness, right? And that when we are experiencing states of flow and are highly coherent, you know, that we're efficient, that there's a pleasure to it, that there's a willingness to go further, that there's a quality of easy and good relationships. And that, so therefore, we want to understand as much as we can about how those states work. Um, and the only thing that I've experienced is that coherence is really important to human efficiency, but differentiation and struggle is important to human creativity. And so the question that I have and that I bring up a lot in the groups I work with because I've come from the conflict field is, how is it that we can take something like difference, which is naturally occurring in human systems? I mean, when a child is born, a child is joined with the mother, and the very first act of being born is differentiation. When we talk about human... Um, Robert Keegan defines human development as identification or sameness, differentiation, where you become separate or different from the, the group you originate in, and integration. When we look at brain science, it's, it's the exact same thing. You have a coherent brain, new neural pathways are created, those neural pathways are, are integrated, and the brain continues to evolve. So this is, a, this is a principle that's at work all the time. So whenever we talk about coherence, I want to make sure we're talking about differentiation at the same time, because they're always part and parcel to each other. And so how do we create coherence? And, and learn, see, because differentiation is exciting in the body until it isn't. And that's one of the differences. I mean, the same is true of coherence as well. You can, it can be very satisfying and safe, but if there's too much of it, it becomes kind of complacent and stagnating. And so I like conversations in which coherence and differentiation are placed together and that we actually learn how to work with it in a way that, that contributes to the creativity of a room and to the new emergence in a room. But it's harder because every, when, when it starts to stimulate fight or flight, as we know we want to leave or conflict or, as we've talked about, shut down when it's too extreme. So part of what I have to work with is the right amount of difference in a room. Like when do I, almost like an acupuncturist as a facilitator, when do I stimulate and help stimulate a group by bringing up difference, by saying, hey, if I were you, I'd be mad about what he just said. You know, or hey, I feel, you might feel fine about it, but if I were you, I'd feel betrayed. You know, like when do I actually take on the perspectives that aren't in the room because you can't quite get them in there, and I just take it on as the facilitator and represent it and create actually a little more conflict in the room, and when do I say, Let's take a moment to breathe and to feel, and for just a moment turn to the person next to you, express what it is you're experiencing, and your partner's going to receive you really deeply, and then you're going to flip. 
and I bring listening into the room to settle and soothe everyone. So that play is really, really important to me. So I don't know if I disagree with Jamie and Daniel as much as I just have this emphasis on the utilization of differentiation, you know, and it can be related to gender or socioeconomic status or how we perceive healing or whatever it, whatever it is, you know, it can have to do with national identity. We could talk about the relationship of America to Britain and how do we feel and really having to let some of those differences come out because inevitably when you navigate those well, you create deeper trust. As soon as differences can emerge and people can find out how to work with them, they trust each other more and then it becomes an even more safe group than it was previous. Yeah, I got a really uh, good vision of maybe your facilitation style then, that you're sensing into what the perspectives are that are maybe under the surface or are, are not being acknowledged and then bringing those in, which I think is, it sounds like a really, like really valuable, skilled thing to do. But that also, that sounds like a very dangerous thing to be doing as well. How do you know that you're not imposing your stuff onto it? And, and how, are you, how are you doing that in a safe way? Well, the, in, my, in my training, what I do is I train people into this very, very important principle, which is always stay open to feedback. Because every gesture we make creates an, an, a, a reaction, as we know, right? So as a facilitator, what I have to do is whenever I take a risk like that is really stay very attuned to how the group receives it. And usually what will happen is if I take a risk like that and I say something that's unspoken, that's in the background, or that is controversial, or that, you know, people aren't going to be able to tolerate, what I do is notice the extent to which they're, that, that it's exciting without becoming threatening. And if it's exciting, I continue. And if it becomes too threatening, I back off and repair. So you're always working in relationship to the feedback. And from that perspective, it's, it's like art. You're always in conversation with your own gestures, you might say. Yeah, and also kind of playing the edge as well. Yes, absolutely. And the edge is really, really important because that's where the emergence is. It's at the, that, we like to call it that frothy edge. It's that little tremulousness. You can collapse back into what's known or you can, you can emerge into what's new and that, but you have to be able to know how to stay there and how to navigate that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, one of my meditation teachers, Chogam Trungpa, said a very important thing uh, that always stuck with me. He said, be yourself, the world will give you feedback, that it's completely reliable. It brings up a question as well of, because there's a real acute sensitivity required to, to be able to do that. And something that, that I've thought quite a bit about is the gender difference in these areas. In particular, the collective intelligence question, because I think the first piece that we did had mostly all men. We, we've since then uh, interviewed Benita Roy. But that seems like that, that being in the moment of real emotional openness feels more like a feminine, uh, a, a bit, something that women might be better at than, than men doing that kind of work. But then, do you have a sense about what the gender difference is or, or whether there are differences between men and women's um, not suitability for the work, but, but different skill sets within this kind of area? I, I mean, I think, I think the differences are really important. I think some of, them, some of them could be gendered in the sense of a particular kind of uh, emotional sensitivity or um, an ability to, to strategize quickly and to imagine tactics you know, relatively efficiently. So I think there are those general trends. But I think the biggest lesson I've taken away in terms of training mediators is to simply share how I work and the models that I'm working with and then notice how the individual facilitators integrate and express those through their own intelligence, whatever it happens to be. And lots of times I'll be watching students of mine and I'll think, what are they doing? <laughs> like, this is a disaster in the making. And then they just pull it out and I'll just be amazed. And so it's a little bit of kind of trusting that the way people train and receive the information and integrate it into their own way of working kind of works. But I have a, I have a hard time being able to always understand. So in that, in that very specific 
intelligence of a body mind that includes a national identity, that includes a history of trauma, that in her, includes gender or non-gender identity, that includes whatever it includes, that somehow these kinds of intelligences can go, can take hold and can also manifest. So I really trust that. And you, you mentioned before as well about the dialogue between coherence and difference and how you, I think you also said that you need coherence first before you can introduce difference. Is that sort of creating um, safety or is that creating connection between uh, people in the group and then introducing more difficult topics to explore? What does that look like? Well, for, well, for me, I think there, there are certain things that have to be in place prior to working with any group. And so one has to be a shared intention. What is the purpose for being here? The other is a, the, the kind of ground rules. And so one of the ground rules that, that I work with is that we're being for everyone and realizing that everybody has a responsibility to determine the outcome. So sometimes, for instance, in conversations on, on race relations or issues regarding equity, those kinds of things, I have to really make sure that everybody's bought into the process and that everybody's bought into everyone else. Because if that isn't in place, then there are certain things that just will not get accomplished. Um, and then coherence is important because we are so embodied and we're so sensitive that when we are functioning as one, and when the body is relaxed and extending and there isn't a really hard and fast boundary between you and me, but we're relaxed and we're sort of the animal of the tribe is kind of intact, and then the mind is empty. And usually what you find in high states of coherence is the mind is also empty. It's very present. It's what we try to cultivate in mindfulness meditation. The mind is empty, available, present, and listening is happening easily and spontaneously. If you can help people have that experience and this you know, psychological safety or a sense of belonging, then from there we can actually start to differentiate um, because we have a state to return to that everyone can recognize. So if you come in differentiated, lots of times the first task is actually to relieve the room of the differentiation and to bring people into coherence and then to return to it and really map and help people see and experience what's happening in their bodies and in their minds, you know. And people start to trust that we literally are one mind. You know, we can differentiate and be very separate, but we also could be in exactly the same point of view. That doesn't mean our cognition is functioning the same way, but it means our awareness is completely continuous with one another. And that that's a really optimal state for people to function from. I just want to return a little bit to the question I asked before about the delicacy of if you are facilitating in that way where you're kind of taking a risk, you're saying something that you think might need to be expressed and maybe potentially bringing in anger or bringing in whatever the emotions that is, that I, I've seen that go very badly wrong in the past. I've seen like the, the whole idea of like crazy wisdom where you, you have a like someone like Chogyam Trumpa, who was a sort of master of that way of working, is an exception. But you do, the idea of crazy wisdom just gives a lot of people an excuse to be, uh, behave really badly. And it can go wrong. I've seen, I've seen people who are saying, oh, I'm just, I'm just speaking for the collective, when it's quite clear they're actually speaking from their own personal sociopathic um, behavior. And how do you tell the difference? And what are the dangers in this kind of space? Well, I think you just described what the dangers are, you know, is that, um, you know, for instance, somebody, somebody asked me that. I was just recently in a, an event in Los Angeles and facilitated a group of 120 people, and we were doing this experience of going back and forth between sameness and difference. And somebody said to me afterwards, but, you know, how are you sure that everybody's integrated that and that people aren't necessarily... Um, really stirred up. And usually the way I do that is by just simply listening to the, the kind of feedback that comes my way. You know, I trust sort of the field, you might say, what you were talking about a little bit earlier. The danger with crazy wisdom is crazy wisdom is interpreted as some really kind of immature thing of I'm just going to do what I want and let the chips fall. You know, that's, that's what people mean by it. Cra crazy wisdom, I think, is just sometimes utilizing that which is more unconventional in the service of the whole. So you still, you know, Trungpa's 
his intelligence was really deep and really broad. Now, I, I think there were probably things that happened that were not so great, but for the most part, my understanding is, is that invoking something unconventional to actually support a group in going further in their experience together can be important, and I have done it. And I, I, I can't say that I've had very many experiences in my 30-plus years of mediating that have gone terribly off the rails. I've certainly had moments, you know, but then I've found ways to bring people back. I don't, I don't have a track record of leaving people in a chaotic heap for the most part. One of the things that came up in the conversation with Benita Roy was she said that one of the blocks to collective intelligence practice or collective insight practice is autobiographical coherence, by which I think she means this need we have to make everything consistent with our story we're telling about ourselves. What, what do you make of that? I, well, I think she's right, you know, because to the extent that we're telling a story, Cognition is preoccupied with that story, and, it, and our awareness cannot be extended as openly as it would otherwise. And that there is, you know, the ego is a fascinating thing. You know, what, is, what exactly is the ego? Um, you know, I try in my own teaching, in my own work, to say that the, the ego is not wrong, but the ego is limited. And that the ego does create division in the mind, because where there's a narrative, that narrative is separating us from our immediate experience. So for instance, someone will come into a group and make a statement how I'm an introvert and therefore blah, blah, blah. And I, I'll say to them, great, so let's make sure that we employ some techniques where you get to think on your own and you have a few minutes to think before you speak. And I'm also wondering, would you be willing to suspend that idea that you're an introvert and an extrovert for the purposes of what we're doing? And, the, and that sense that, oh, I may just, I could actually be free of that category I've put myself in, you know, is really, really important because as soon as people start referencing this category, they become less available to what's actually happening. And if they're doing that, they're probably in some state of needing to protect or plan or strategize safety. So I think that, that if you can increase the safety and the actual embodied experience of well-being in the room, that sometimes will take care of that. Mm. Yeah, and there's, there's this constant dialogue, I guess, between our personality structure and then moving beyond it into connecting more with what you might call the essence or the, the potential beyond that. My, my yeah, friend, yeah. Yeah, my friend Raffia has another way of describing that that I think is really beautiful, which is that the ego was an intelligent strategy to survive in the environment we grew up in. So it's not wrong, it's just out of date. Oh, that's a good one. I like that too. I like that too. I think the, Buddha, the Buddha's insight was, was a good one. His insight was basically that to the extent that we're self-identified, the self by its nature is, is not um, continuous with reality. The self is separate. And where the self is separate, the self is also stressed. The self is also striving in a certain way to survive so that when that can be relaxed and the experience of more c continuity with what is in the natural environment and in the immediacy of the moment, that we actually function much better. So that quality of, of the analytic mind dividing us from our immediate experience I think is important too. And the other distinction that Benita drew out that I think was really useful and I've seen various people make a similar point is this, that there has to be a, a, a difference made between an environment that is based around belonging needs and one that is potentially able to go into new territory. And I think yeah. David Dada talked about this as well, like trauma and, and yoga yeah. is a very different thing. Um, you, you can either be in a process of dealing with our sort of wounds and trauma, but if we're going into a space of genuine new emergence where something that maybe has never happened before and we're pushing ourselves to our edge, those two things are completely distinct. And, yeah. and collective insight practice where we might be wanting to generate new ideas and new genuine novelty is in the latter category. And belonging needs, we have to be at a stage of development where our belonging needs are taken care of before we can enter into the genuine emergent space. Does that scan? I, I think so. I, 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 I like those distinctions that David's made, uh, the, the kind of healing or more therapeutic environment. I think he uses the word art, which I use a lot too, which has to do with, you, you could talk about growth, but you can also talk about 
you know, breaking into new territory and creativity and novelty um, is a different imperative. And then I think he also makes the distinction of, of spiritual awakening, which is moving beyond identification. In his, in his mind, discovering the absolute, that which is unqualifiable, unconditioned, and utterly indestructible, and then how to manifest that in the world. So he distinguishes between therapy, art, and spiritual practice. I think those are very worthwhile distinctions for my work. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.